Welcome to Small Practice Support Information Session Number 50. In this Law Society of Ireland recording, Julie Hutton of the Irish Centre for Diversity talks to Siobhan Masterson and Keegan Malley about gender equality, diversity and inclusion at your workplace. Welcome everybody to uh, this latest version of Small Practice Information uh, Session. I'm going to hand over to Siobhan now. Uh, and so Siobhan, thank you. Hi. Hello everyone and welcome. Thanks for joining us today. So we have Julie Hutton, the Head of Operations at the Irish Centre of Diversity. She is going to talk to us today about um, our new law study, Gender Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Policy. Um, so the policy has been established because of a recommendation from the Law Studies Gender Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. And the Irish Centre of Diversity has developed this um, and we've worked alongside them to adapt some of the language so it suits the solicitor's profession. Um, before Julie goes into the presentation um, to discuss how solicitors workplaces can adopt this policy and use it in practice um, and the benefits of it, um, I'll just give you a bit of background on the Irish Centre for Diversity. Um, so they work in partnership with organisations of all sizes across Ireland to help them embed equality, diversity and inclusion, EDI, which Julie might mention a bit later, in all that they do. Um, their services include the highly prestigious investors in diversity accreditation, which in Ireland's only all-encompassing diversity and inclusion mark, offering a holistic approach to improving equality and diversity across all grounds. Um, so Julie is now going to go through our new diversity and inclusion policy, which you will be able to find on the Law Society website on our diversity and inclusion page. So that's www.lawsociety.ie forward slash G-E-D-I. You'll find it there later on. So Julie, off to you. Uh, hi, Sean. Thank you for that introduction and thank you, Keith, for the welcome. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, so a pre-prepared um, presentation to just take us through the, um, the thoughts around the policy around the gender equality, diversity and inclusion policy, um, as Siobhan's just mentioned. So um, as uh, already said, I'm, apologies, just technical hitch there. Um, I'm Julie Hutton. I'm the head of operations with the Irish Centre for Diversity, and we um, have a team of um, head office staff and a team also of advisors that can support organisations of all sizes in their EDI journey. This presentation and the, um, the policy itself were prepared for the Law Society of Ireland, so we thank them for the opportunity to work with you. Um, we're going to talk about, first of all, the importance of an effective diversity and inclusion policy. Um, it's one thing to have a policy in place. It's quite a different thing for it to actually be meaningful within a business. As a previously uh, previous quality insurance um, manager, I know policies can just sit on a shelf um, and just be a tick box. The idea of diversity and inclusion policy is that it should be around setting and reflecting the tone of the organisation, the culture that they want to have in place a welcoming, diverse, inclusive and, and equal organisation to work with. Um, so the policy should set and reflect that tone, uh, aspirational tone. It should also be clear that the organisation is making a commitment to diversity and inclusion. So the content of the policy should reflect that, com that organisation's commitment, but equally it also should reference the legislation that sits around quality, diversity, inclusion. So there are two pieces of legislation, and these are referenced in the policy that um, is being shared by the Law Society. There's the Equal Status Acts and the Equal Employment Acts. Um, I'm not putting the dates of those in there because um, that they are obviously always being amended. The policy itself references the current version of those acts, but obviously those would always be revised and reviewed regularly to ensure that they reflect current legislation as that changes. And for these reasons, having a diversity and inclusion policy is an essential, a mandatory requirement of the Irish Centre for Diversity's Investors in Diversity Framework that Siobhan mentioned in the introduction. You cannot achieve our award without actually, as a minimum, having a diversity and inclusion policy in place. So that's the importance that the Irish Centre for Diversity places on the policy. It should be, um, in order to be effective, should be a reflection of the commitment of your firm um, and it should be then can then be used as an opportunity to provide an internal and external message about a commitment around diversity and inclusion. It's a, around giving you a framework a route map so that 
you're very clear on the direction of travel that your firm intends to take around diversity inclusion. Um, and it's um, important that the actual document itself reflects your current practice. And we're going to be talking about bespoking the policy that the Law Society has in place um, to make it fit for your individual organisation, your individual firm. It is a framework in terms of it also references other documentation policy process that you might have already within your firm's QA system. And even in those very small um, firms where there may be one or two people, you will have policy and process. It's your a law firm. So you will have standards and, and regulations that you need to adhere to. So the framework of the policy provides you with an opportunity to um, inform and cross-reference to the appropriate sections of your own QA system. So making it yours, this is what is important aspect, and I'm sure Siobhan will agree here, that this is a generic um, JEDI, G-E-D-I po policy that's been offered to you. Um, it can be um, tailored to your individual firm and it should reflect your practice. So the 10 sections in the policy can really be grouped under three main headings. So there's context, the purpose, the reason why the policy is in place, the objectives, and those should reflect your organization's objectives who it applies to, the scope of the, um, of the policy, that will be internal and external um, people. The general, the, the key um, concepts of around equality, diversity, inclusion, things like discrimination, bullying, harassment, and those sorts of key concepts, discrimination, as I said, um, and the context of what quality means, what diversity means, those sorts of things. And then also the management and delivery of the policy for a very small uh, firm that might just be re um, reduced to the to current length. It might be reduced to just two or three paragraphs or two or three sentences. For a larger firm, that might be all of the content that's, that's there. So the management and delivery of the policy is important because it's about actually keeping that as a live a living document. The body of the policy is around some key aspects of where equality, diversity, inclusion can have the most significant con uh, con uh, impact in terms of the content. So we talk in there about commitments around selection, recruitment, retention, being fair, equal, inclusive. We talk about service delivery, so outward facing in terms of the commitments around delivering an equal, fair, diverse, inclusive um, service to your clients and the procurement section around engaging with external organizations um, to deliver products on behalf of your, you or actually providing services or products to you as a firm. Then the last section is the maintenance because a policy is really only um, as good as its most current version. So monitoring it, evaluating the, the impact of it, reviewing the, the policy regularly is about keeping it as a living document, reflective of current legislation, current uh, situation in the firm, etc. So that's the sections of the policy. Um, so bespoking them is about applying your firm's branding. It has to be seen as your organization's document. You, there's some find and replace fields. So there's insert firm name, things like that, where it um, it's, needs to be filled in order to, for it to be reflective of the names of the people in your organization, your organization's name, etc. cetera. Um, there are references to policies within that uh, document. So checking those policy references, are they called the same in your firm? Are they, do they exist in your firm? And if they don't, should they, or if they don't actually, that's fine because of the size of the organization you have. It has to, you have to be confident that it can reflect the content in practice. Um, it can only really be a living document if it truly reflects what your firm is actually doing. So when you're reviewing it in terms of bespoking the policy, um, it is important that you read all of the content to ensure that actually is this what we're going to be delivering on. It is appropriate um, that in some instances you might remove elements that aren't applicable to your own firm. Um, that's fine. And if you need some support and advice on that, I'm sure Siobhan or the team there or the Irish Centre for Diversity would be more than happy to support you in better understanding those elements and whether they actually truly are um, applicable to your firm. Things like the uh, length of all of the different uh, management elements, for example, might be cut down. Some of the um, uh, service delivery part might be cut down. Some of the procurement elements might be cut down depending on the size of your firm. Um, so when you look at the policy, don't feel 
okay, we've got to keep everything in there. It does, and it's the point at the bottom there, it does need to be recognisable as your firm's policy to your people. It needs to be um, something that your, resonates with the people in your firm so that they actually know what the commitment is, what their expectations are that are being placed on them. So taking it then from a, a, a policy to a lived experience, a lived document, um, we talk in here about consulting with staff on the content of the policy, um, looking at whether all of those sections are relevant, looking at um, do they apply to the staff, uh, to the team in your organisation. And although there is a, a, some sort of commitment statement in terms of the purpose of the policy, it might be appropriate to de develop a further bespoke commitments, a shorter commitment statement that reflects your firm. Um, so that then starts them organize, uh, the people in your organisation really engaging in the content of the policy. It is also appropriate to let people know that you have it, um, embed it through induction, introductions, through some sort of formal launch maybe, um, because having it on a shelf in a hidden cupboard or on a drive that nobody shares um, is really not a living document. So ensuring that all of your teams, all of your un staff understand and know that there are, um, that that exists. A living document is one that doesn't remain static. It's constantly reviewed. Um, and usually that would be for a planned review cycle, something like an annual review, revision of the content. It's appropriate also to make it truly live, to refer to it regularly within your firm. So referencing sections of it within briefings, looking at the content with your teams during appraisal and looking at how you're fulfilling the policy through appraisals. Also looking at maybe delivering some training on the content, um, some learning activities around the content of the policy. This is what the policy says. What does that look like in real life? Looking, what does it look like in our firm? Looking at discussions around that. And also then in touching on that also is applying the content in appropriate context. What I mean by that is when somebody's talking about equality, diversity, inclusion, making reference to the policy, drawing people's attention to the policy. Maybe um, when somebody maybe is, is going through a particular aspect of diversity, inclusion, um, drawing their, their attention to the content, the content of the policy. Um, and I'm not talking necessarily just about if there's a concern or a complaint, but also if there's maybe good practice, or oh, that's really helpful because that references and really demonstrates our commitment to EDI within the policy. So um, that's quite a brief introduction to the policy. Um, the, obviously, once you had a chance to read the content, um, you'll see what, what I mean by those sort of being able to amend um, and embed the policy within your organisation. Um, but are there any questions um, at this point? Um, Siobhan, I think you're going to sort of manage those. Yeah. I suppose I start off, start off the questions. I can imagine some people are thinking, you know, how much of this policy do I have to adopt for the, what's the minimum amount? I imagine the full policy would be the gold standard. But if I were to drop off a few things because I was a smaller practice and I, and I don't think I could commit to them fully, what would you recommend are the ones that I need to need to keep? Okay, yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, I think the, the purpose, the commitment statements, um, you a, a very small firm is, is unlikely to need a, the length of the management of the, of the um, policy management areas. Um, there's quite a lot in there in terms of the roles and responsibilities. And so that is possibly could be shortened um, to, uh, to just one statement around the, the need to ensure that it's a living document and whose responsibility that is. If a firm doesn't really engage in any sort of procurement, they are delivering just on their behalf, then that procurement section, it is appropriate, therefore, to maybe just remove that. That's that's not a problem at all. As I said in the section around looking at the bespoking, it's about it reflecting the current practice. What we've got here is a bells and whistles version of the policy in terms of all the sorts of things that it's appropriate to think about in terms of college diversity inclusion that could be considered to go into the policy. Um, when you're looking at it, it does truly need to be reflective of your own organisation. So, you know, an eight page policy is possibly overkill for a, a one or two person firm, um, but might be really um, needed for a much larger organisation. Um, but it's it's around it being fit for purpose for this firm that you're working in. Does, I hope that answers the question. 
Sorry, can, can I uh, check or ask a question that's just come in, Julie? Of uh, course. By the way, you might uh, uh, stop share uh, sharing the screen. Yeah. Uh, that, that'll be great. Uh, yeah, there's a question here has come in. Is there room uh, in a policy document for uh, reflecting more aspirations than just uh, reflecting current policy? Uh, certainly, yeah, because what you can do in your objectives section of the policy, you could be setting objectives that are a distance away. You know, you, you actually might aspirationally say our commitment to EDI is to achieve this and you, you might possibly put in a date by 2025 or 2023 or whatever that date is. It can be aspirational. As I say, it's about it being tailored to the needs of your individual firm. And it is in terms of the objectives, yes, aspirational objectives, because if you don't vision it, you can't, you're, you're unlikely to be moving towards that, are you? If you can't see what you want it aspirationally to look like, you're unlikely to, to, to really move in that direction. So. And, and just to follow up to that, I'm thinking, you know, if you're putting aspirational objectives in place, should you engage with your employees in that? Or, you know, should you bring this to your employees and say, this is what we're doing? Or do you recommend engaging with them on the policy and saying, this is what we could be doing? Um, I think engaging with them in terms of the tailoring of the policy is probably an ideal opportunity. It's part of the introduction and embedding because it then becomes their document as well as just rather than imposed policy that is completely aspirational that they don't feel they could ever achieve. Whereas if they're engaged in the development of, of the tailoring and the bespoking of the policy, then I, I think that was a really good idea, actually, because you're then making sure that you've got your team with you. Um, and they feel that, they, that they've then got ownership of it. And you're quite right. They will then be able to sort of challenge, well, there's this in there. Well, we're never going to achieve that. Uh, but then there might be a discussion around, well, we want to achieve that. What, how can we go about, you know, what resources can we put in place to achieve that? Is there more training needed or something like that? So that opens the opportunity for discussion um, in terms of, you know, additional resources. Great. Um, Keith, I might share my screen here and just show um, those online what the policy actually looks like and where they can access it on, on the website. Um, so, should be able to see that there. So this is sitting um, on the Law Society website. If you go to the diversity and inclusion page and scroll down, there's the gender equality, diversity and inclusion policy. Um, and you'll see here what Julie was saying about personalizing it. This is where you can put your firm logo um, and the details in, who the person is responsible, um, the last amended and reviewed by, um, and just personalizing it for um, your workplace. Um, and you'll see all the different sections there. So just when you go onto the website, that's what you're going to be faced with and that's what it looks like. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add there, Julie. There's your purpose and objectives. Um, and there's the different pieces that you can per personalize um, and shorten depending on the size of your um, practice or firm. So yes, I just that's... stop my, that's it there. Um, so it's, it's in, in full, it's about um, a 10 page document. But course that's the gold standard bells and whistles that you said earlier um so that's that yep. but this is something that a, a firm can then put together very quickly that there isn't a huge amount of uh, uh, propriety work necessary I think the team, Siobhan and the team have done some of that preparatory work already. They've uh, bespoke the generic version of the policy that the Irish Centre for Diversity has already in place for any firm that wishes to use it. You know, any firm that's maybe listening to this recording that isn't a, a law firm um, can contact the Irish Centre and we'd be more than happy to share um, our generic, more generic version. This, some of the work around bespoking it for a law firm has already been done, Siobhan, hasn't it, by the, the Jedi? Yeah, so we, we've looked at some of the language used and just kind of the terms and, and bits in it and made sure that it, it's applicable to solicitors' workplaces. Um, but like you mentioned there, Julie, you have a generic one, which might some in-house solicitors or some solicitors' clients might be interested in looking at for them as well. Um, and they can contact the Centre of Diversity directly for information on that. Um, and just, just on the other... Jedi initiatives at the Law Society, you know, there's commitment there and, and owning the document. There's also the Law Society's Gender Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Charter, um, which solicitors' workplaces can publicly commit to. 
and the details of that are on the, the website as well. And um, there's 115, 118 already signed up to that. And it's everything from in-house solicitors, smaller practices, sole practitioners to larger firms. Um, and once you commit to that, your name is published on our website. So that's kind of a public commitment um, of how you're uh, going to promote gender equality, diversity and inclusion as well. So it's an additional step that you might like to take if you're looking at this policy too. So. Could I just also just quickly say that the title of the policy is Gender Equality, Diversity, Inclusion, because obviously that's the uh, framework within which the law society is moving. The policy itself is equally applicable, and you'll have just seen a, a, a a little snapshot there as, as Siobhan was sharing the policy that it does reference all of the nine grounds so the policy itself actually the content of the policy although it's called gender equality diversity inclusion policy is applicable to all of the other nine grounds as well um, so when a firm is making a commitment to equality diversity inclusion gender tends to be the most obvious one because it's the one that's been traditionally the one that's that is forefront of people's minds and it's historically been the struggle I guess in in terms of the you know balance of, of workforce but the actual policy itself the content of the policy is equally applicable to any of the nine grounds can i ask you julie a question just about the impact internally within a firm you know if a firm decides to uh, uh, to adopt uh, a policy like this and then goes through the process of uh, documenting it and getting agreement you know in a firm maybe that employs four five six people how is that likely to impact I think the biggest impact is opening the, the conversation um, when you're when you're adopting a policy such as this. Uh, if you, as Siobhan was su suggesting, engaging staff in bespoking that to your own individual organisation, the biggest impact that we've found in the Irish Centre is opening that conversation around, um, you know, we've always worked this way, you know, what are the benefits of having a more diverse and equal and, and inclusive workforce? What those sorts of conversations are, um, can often, is probably the biggest um, impact on the, those conversations um, to to open out the discussion. Um, and I think that do, having a document like a policy, especially when it's a lived doc policy, gives people an opportunity to have those in a, in a structured way rather than a sort of um, opening a conversation that has nowhere to go. An organisation that's introducing a policy is showing to its staff it's got a commitment to this. And then staff feel more able to ask those challenging questions um, and and say well the policy says this how are we going to do that as an organization and then the firm can then say well we want, want you to work with us on that so it becomes a two-way com conversation communication and presumably uh, quite often uh, you know individual staff members will will get quite a sense of security out of this uh you know if if the firm is making a commitment in terms of diversity and uh, a, a person you know is uh feels in some way marginalized in some aspect of their life uh th this has to be a, a supportive uh framework it definitely yeah i would say definitely and and that's why we've included an, a number of the commitment statements that we have in the recruit rec recruitment selection and retention section we will do this. We will not do that. We will um, support you regardless of your difference. We we will not dis discriminate against you um, based on any of the nine grounds. So it's clear and, tra and transparent commitment statements that the firm is making by adopting the policy. So yeah, I would hope then that and through the conversations as well, the two way conversations would reassure staff. Um, yeah, I think that that bottom line that is definitely true. Yeah. Great. Shivam. Yeah, I think that's it for me. Um, just a reminder again that the policy and all the initiatives of, of the law study are doing in, in, on gender equality, diversity and inclusion are available on the website and um, www.lawstudy.ie forward slash JEDI, so G-E-D-I. Um, and you can sign up to the charter there and access the policy and download it. Um, and look, if you follow up questions, you can send them on to myself or Julie as well. Yeah. So. And the Irish Centre for Diversity is there to support whoever wants the support. So if you do feel that you want some help with the, um, the policy, looking at the generic policy, any questions around diversity inclusion, um, more than happy um, to take those. So irishcentreforddiversity.ie is our website. Well, that's great. Thank you. Great. Uh, Siobhan, I'm sure you want to say thanks to Julie. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Um, we really appreciate it, uh, you coming on today to talk about it. and. Um, this this video will be up on on our 
diversity and inclusion webpage as well. So um, if anyone wants to watch back or listen back to anything that was said, we can we'll have it up there and available. Thanks for the opportunity. Been brilliant Thank speaking you. with you both.